Hey guys, coming to you from Atlanta, Georgia today. And I want to give you a theory. Tell me if this correlates with your experiences. It's a theory about a type of person. Very popular, very common type of person that you see everywhere. Every social circle, every movement has probably the majority of participants are of this type. This type of person is more concerned with how fashionable their ideas are rather than how accurate their ideas are. They care much more about the appearance of being social, civil, having the right ideas that look good, that reflect well on them for having high class ideas, than they do having correct ideas, even if the correct ideas are unpopular. This is a theory I've been working on for many years because as somebody who's in the minority camp where I don't care about the popularity of my opinions, I found lots of backlash, uh, lots of criticism of my ideas purely on fashionable grounds, not on logical or intellectual grounds. But I'm reminded of this because of a kerfluffle that happened in the libertarian community. This a speaker at a conference, Jeff Deist, used the word blood, words blood and soil. Now there's a whole group of people of a certain type who are saying, oh, this is Nazi dog whistling, or this just doesn't look good. You can't use those words in civilized discourse in the modern world. So anyway, here are some properties of this type of person. I think it's psychological properties, you could personality properties, but I'm seeing correlations everywhere with this type of person. Like I said, number one, their ideas are based on fashionability. Almost one level below it, there's this belief about social behavior and antisocial behavior that kind of rooted at how they judge ideas is they want ideas to be socially acceptable and inclusive. That you can't have any beliefs that come across as being antisocial because that means you're not you're not cool. Really this group of people reminds me of kind of like a clique of teenage girls that it's the popularity and coolness fashionability is much more important than consistency and pursuit of truth. Anyway, I've noticed, philosophically speaking, that an extremely common idea amongst this type of people is a version of relativism. It comes in many flavors. But the idea that, well, you can't know truth, you can't know objective truth, that would be antisocial, that would be kind of juvenile. In fact, they look down on claims of having access to some kind of truth as being simplistic, naive, something like that. I think I understand what's going on here. I thought a lot about this. There's a really strong correlation between these type of people and relativistic beliefs. And I think it has to do something with like this, that when you are a relativist and you say there's no firm foundation for critical thinking, everybody's ideas just like just as well founded as everybody else's, we're just stating our opinions, nobody's wrong, it is almost immediately more socially acceptable. If you're in a group of people and you can say something like, nobody in here is really wrong. You know, we're all just trying to grasp at it with little glimmers of truth, but really, maybe I'm a percent closer to truth than you, but really, you know, we're all, we're, we all don't know what we're talking about. That's way more fashionable than the more correct belief, which is to say, everybody in this group is wrong, most likely. And unless you've done a massive amount of really hard research about the foundations of philosophy and critical thinking, you're just spouting opinions that are ill-formed, <laughs> which of course is my belief, a few other people's beliefs, but that is true. That if it's the case that truth is discoverable, then it's also the case that almost nobody knows what, what the heck they're talking about. The other thing I've noticed along these lines is that there's actually a, a, a pride in the relativism. There's a pride in, I would even say, paradox and contradiction in somebody's own belief system. There's a certain individual comes to mind that I had a, a limited professional relationship with years ago that is very much of this type, very much of the fashionable type. And we were talking about philosophy and contradiction. And he said almost verbatim that in, uh, consistency, intellectual consistency, is the mark of a limited mind. <laughs> that that you, are, you grow up when you accept the inconsistencies and the words he used, a quote from Walt Whitman, I am large, I contain multitudes. In other words, if I contradict myself 
so be it. I'm bigger than that. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with contradiction and tension in my worldview. It's kind of an extreme example, but I think there's a measure of fashionable pride that people have with this mindset when they're talking about um, inconsistency. Like, yeah, we're all inconsistent. You know, who are you to say you're consistent? Pfft. You don't realize how inconsistent everybody's worldview is. There's also a very strong judgment, ironically enough, an antisocial judgment, ironically enough, that these people have towards people like me who are more of the rationalistic tendency, whose purpose in communicating is to try to communicate true information and not say nice things that make you more popular. There's a kind of like, oh, that dude's, that dude's on the spectrum. Like, he doesn't have many friends. Or, you know, right? There's a... There's a, which I guess is, it's almost predatory and could be explained, I think, fairly consistently in this way of thinking. But there's, there's a kind of intentional cutting out of people who are going to be in your friend circle challenging your relativistic beliefs or challenging your sometimes silly beliefs in whatever area of thought. So if you're, if you are going to be trying to a cool, fashionable kid, and you've got old Joe over here that's in your friend circle telling everybody why he's wrong and talking about ideas and oh, man. He's like ruining the feng shui, man. So there's a kind of social incentive to cut out objective thinkers from your friend circles or clear uh, thinkers with a backbone. People who really genuinely have a backbone and who are willing to stand up for what they believe in, cut them out of your social circle because they're going to cause tension. And that's true. I do personally cause tension in social circles in some circumstances because I want to talk about ideas. Not in an aggressive way, not in a mean way. I'm just okay with the idea that people are wrong all the time, ideas are important, and so if somebody gets a little embarrassed for having a wrong belief, that's okay. That's part of the process of discovering truth. So I've also noticed another correlation with these people. They tend to be more on the artistic end of the spectrum, for what reason I'm not quite sure, but they especially seem to be drawn to the avant-garde, the brand new, the cutting edge brand new. Just think back to the teenage girl analogy, right? What was cool, a cool fashion last month, is now so lame this month, right? It's cool to be like, oh, that's not cool. Like, I'm way cooler than that. You know, you're wearing those shoes. Oh my gosh, that's so last week, so last month, right? That's cool. That makes you cool. It separates yourself from the group. So I think that's part of the draw to the avant-garde. Even when it gets avant-garde, turns into absurdism, like you know, putting crucifix crucifixes into a pool of urine and calling it art because hey, that's cool. It's avant-garde. But also, just the artisticness is something. Um, and I have two, ex two potential explanations for it. One is these people's brains work a little bit differently. And so they are naturally better artists. They, are, can't they have access to some part of their brain which is representing sense data to them in a way that they can express more effectively, maybe. Or, what I suspect might be going on, is it's cool. Art, at least in our current modern culture, is seen as cool, being on the edge, being oh, individualistic. Oh, wow, he sees the world so differently. Nobody gets him. You know, uh, it's cool. And so that's why people are drawn into it. I'm leaning more that direction than the former, but I don't know. Now, a really strong correlation I've seen is with these type of people and tendencies towards mental health issues. So definitely with the artistic. I think lots of people know that. Like, they're a lot of really artistic people can sometimes be a little crazy. But I think um, like manic depressive people tend to ha think more like this. Or I, I've just seen the correlation a million times that if somebody is like aggressively, you know, truth doesn't exist, everything's relative, and you're so antisocial to think anything otherwise, and I can't entertain it, blah, those people tend to have mental problems, um, sometimes significant mental problems, depression, anxiety. Um, and again, this isn't a judgment. It's just a correlation, an interesting correlation. Here's another correlation that I've seen, and tell me if this rings true to your experiences, that this type of person tends to be very promiscuous. That the idea of sexual commitment to one partner is seen as, uh, is disparaged, is like seen as archaic and like silly, and if you can sleep around, why wouldn't you? Because it just makes so much more sense. Uh, that might also have a correlation with the mental health, the kind of the emotional instability problems, the fashionability, like the insecurity problems. I, I would say a lot of this comes from insecurity. People want social acceptance and so they're willing to do whatever they can to get that kind of social acceptance. Another correlation that I've seen very strongly is that this type of person tends to be way more okay with lying. Lying in small ways, lying in big ways. Again, this seems to correlate with all the other, all the other um, 
pieces of the puzzle here. But a communication to them, I think, is less about trying to communicate the truth as much as it is social signaling, social status virtue signaling. And if in the process of virtue signaling you lie, that's okay, because the end is to look better in the social group, to raise your social status in, in some kind of social hierarchy rather than to communicate true information. I just experienced this recently with the Jason Brennan fiasco. Right? Here's a guy, fits pretty much all of these uh, criteria, and lies, like explicitly lied about me, smeared me as an individual in several ways, explicitly lying, and is obviously okay with it. I don't think that's a coincidence. Which, interestingly enough, ties into the last thing, that the correlation that I've noticed, which is that these people tend to be on the political left. Not a judgment, just a statement of an observation that, by and large, if you fit these criteria, I'm going to put a 98% call here that you are closer to the traditional left than you are the traditional right. Now, maybe you're a left libertarian in Jason Brand's case, or the others, you know, the Horwitzes of the world, if you're in the libertarian circle. Um, you don't have to be a, a literal, you know, you don't have to be a communist, but these psychological properties I've seen almost universally, maybe with a few exceptions, but none are honestly coming to mind. I'm sure maybe I could come up with a few. Correlate with people who are on the left, which, not coincidentally, if you listen to leftist rhetoric, people, uh, left-wing rhetoric, even if it's explicitly communist or left libertarian or whatever, it very much is about the community. It's about the us. It's about working together. It's not, not being xenophobic. Oh my gosh, if you're, if you're xenophobic, right, that's the big, that's the big slur, slur. That means you're like the least cool person in the world. It doesn't really matter, of course, what they mean by xenophobic, but being on the left is cool. You can virtue signal easier. You can be, you can be proud of your cosmo universal cosmopolitanism. Everybody's your friend. There is no truth, so nobody's really wrong. Everybody, it's part of Big Ten philosophy. And also correlated, I think, with lots of arguments on the left, not purely cerebral, right? The, the truth is not actually fundamentally what's important in a lot of left-wing theories, especially when you're talking econo economic theories, which are totally backwards. They always slip in ethics. They always slip in morality. They, also, they always slip in virtue signaling into their economic and political analyses. It's pretty much inevitable. Um, and if you don't see it immediately, just ask a few questions, dig a little bit under the surface, and you'll find this, like, social signaling, posturing, virtue signaling um, type of behavior. So those are my experiences. Those are my observations. Still don't quite know how to deal with these observations. Lots and lots and lots of people in the world that are in prominent positions. And so I'm not sure if the appropriate reaction is to just let them quack, you know, let the ducks quack, and that's the way it is. They're going <laughs> to just kind of ignore them. Or if it's to persuade, I've seen very little evidence of these type of people being open to rational persuasion, especially if what they would be persuaded to is unfashionable. It's pretty much impossible. Um, but yeah, I don't exactly know what to do with that psychological trait. But I wonder if other people have experienced the same thing that I've experienced. If so, tell me about your experiences. Are these, what are the other correlations that you've seen with this type of person that I've described?